Planning and Zoning Commission meeting to order. Today is June 7th, 1923. <laughs> I'd like to welcome everyone this evening. Um, I don't see our newest member yet, but hopefully he'll join us. Yes, I believe he's going to be joining us momentarily. He was having an issue getting online. I just actually spoken to him a few minutes ago. Okay. All right. Just want to give you a heads up. Okay. Thank you. All right. Madam Clerk, can we please start by establishing a quorum? Ms. Kirkner? Here. Mr. Lester? Mr. Hoff? Here. Mr. Kane? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Commissioner Gordon? Here. Secretary Eisenberg? Here. Madam Chair, please let the record reflect that five members are present and we do have a quorum. Okay, thank you. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Secretary, are there any changes to the agenda that was sent to us? No, the agenda is as posted and written. There are no changes for this evening. Thank you. Do I hear a motion for approval of the agenda? I make a motion that we approve this evening's agenda. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye, please. Aye. The agenda is approved. Um, before we move to item five, um, I just want to say that this will be Linda Eisenberg's last meeting with us. And um, I, for one, am going to miss you immensely. Um, and appreciate all you've done and wish you well going forward. So, good luck. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair. I really appreciate that. And yes, this evening is my last meeting. I've been with this planning for planning commission for 10 years um, as bureau chief and then the last five plus years as the director of planning and your secretary and it's been wonderful such a great group to work with them and I miss each and every one of you so I will be sending you my new contact information um, but I hope that we all keep in touch and it's been such a pleasure thank you so much I appreciate it um, and with thank that you. I would like to announce two new um, members to the planning and zoning commission um, we have two new positions that have been filled. Um, the first is Ralph Robertson, and I believe he will be joining us this evening. He was the former um, land um, agricultural preservation specialist with the county for many, many, many years. Actually helped start part of the Ag Pres program in Carroll County. So he's a wealth of knowledge. He will be your full-time member, um, as well as an alternate who was once on the commission about five years ago, um, Mr. Richard Soison will also be joining the Planning Commission at the next meeting on June 20th. Um, and then with that, um, a decision has been made that Mr. Chris Hine, who is the Director of Land and Resource Management, will be the Secretary of the Planning Commission. So he is here this evening. And Chris, do you want to introduce yourself? I know you know them in the capacity of Director of LRM, but uh, at the sure. next meeting, he will be the Secretary of the Commission. Yes, I will. Good evening, good evening everybody. Um, yes, as Linda said, um, the, uh, uh, we're very sorry to hear that uh, Linda is leaving us um, to move on to a new opportunity. And uh, in the interim, the Board of County Commissioners have asked me to act as the um, acting director of planning uh, to help out Linda and her staff in the transition. 
And so in the interim, um, next meeting, I will be acting as the, um, the secretary for you all. So look forward to seeing you all in person at the next meeting. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, and with that, we have a pretty lengthy agenda for our Wednesday evening work session, a lot of items to get to. But again, thank you all so much for the well wishes and I hope we continue to keep in touch. I wish you all the best as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we can now move to your administrative report or was that all you had? On that? that was all I had this evening. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. No worries. Okay. So next up is the Board of Education Facilities Master Plan. Um, and I believe that's Bill Kane. Yes, good evening. Uh, I'm Bill Kane. I'm the facilities planner with the school system. Um, every year I come uh, before the Planning Commission to present uh, the 10 year educational facilities master plan update. Uh, that were required, the school systems required to do annually. Uh, the document um, goes to the board in May and the Board of Education typically approves it in June because it's due to the Maryland Department of Planning by July 1st of every year. Um, the Board of Education this year uh, had, they had so, so many items on the, on the, to discuss related to this year's facility master plan and the, um, the redistricting committee that was formed last year, the Southeast area redistricting committee, they decided to do a work session last week. Um, the work session was held on May 31st. Um, and uh, we discussed the plan along with, uh, gave them an update on uh, where, where these uh, redistricting kind of left off in the fall. Um, um, but the document before you today is what was given, the document that was given to the Board of Education last week. Uh, just, there's a lot of information, obviously, it's a big, pretty pretty big document. Uh, I just wanted to go through some of the highlights, uh, you know, the big, the big ticket items, and then be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, uh, you know, one of the major needs that's identified every year when we look at facilities is, uh, you know, there's there's a couple categories, but one of them that we look at is capacity. Uh, I would say over the last 10 years or, or you know, 10 to 15 years, capacity hasn't been a, an issue, but um, uh, as far as where our enrollments have been, but the current enrollment projections that are a part of the document, um, there's section five in the, um, larger document. Um, the, the enrollment projections this year actually are higher, um, we're projected to go higher than we have been for some time. Uh, the reason for that is back um, the September 30th, last fall's enrollment, we gained, um, or we we enrolled about 740 more students than we're expected. That's a significant increase in enrollment that hasn't been seen in, in the school system probably in 20, 20 plus years, the, that large of a jump. Uh, so obviously when we have that many kids show up in the system in one year, the, the enrollment projections uh, based on uh, that historical enrollment, you know, the, the enrollment projections are going to increase in the future because we have more students today. Um, so just an idea of where the projections are headed. The 10-year the projection, our, our total enrollment is projected to be uh, about 28,500 by the end of the 10-year period, uh, which is almost uh, to the peak of, of total enrollment in the school system. Our peak enrollment was in the 2008 timeframe. Uh, it was a, just shy of 29,000. So, um, uh, the current projections have us almost going back to that number. Now, you know, we do the enrollment projections every year. So um, this current year's historical enrollment is, you know, averaged into the last four years to project the future. Obviously, if next year we, we don't increase that much or it, it changes, the projections next year could change slightly. But um, it is uh, a significant jump. Uh, there was, you know, question about whether is this all 
is this increase all from students returning after uh, the pandemic? Uh, we did look at that. About 30% of the new students that we saw uh, show up last fall were uh, enrolling from private school or, or coming back from homeschool. The other, uh, the majority of the increase actually was from students transferring from other public school systems. So the majority of the increase really came from people moving into the county with, with students, um, which, you know, is a trend pre-pandemic, we were starting to see that increase. Obviously, the pandemic changed that for those couple of years. It, you know, the, the trends were kind of all over the place during the pandemic, but um, it, it, it is a trend that we had been seeing. So uh, I think it speaks to, obviously, the, the county is still obviously a, a place that a lot of people want to move for a lot of number of reasons. Uh, there's still demand to, you know, to move into the county. So um, at this point, we would expect that trend to continue and that the projections are based on that. Um, the other thing I'll note about the projections is they do anticipate a doubling of our pre-K enrollment. Uh, I'm not sure if all of you have heard, but the, you know, the, the state general assembly last year passed the Maryland blueprint uh, for Maryland's future which was a major legislation that's gonna change the way education happens in the state of Maryland. Uh, it, ex it One of the main components of it expanded eligibility for pre-K in public schools across Maryland. Um, they're trying, you know, the goal is to get more pre-K students in into public schools uh, over the next few years. So the projections do anticipate we, we would add about 400 pre-K students uh, to what we currently have. So that that's another factor why the projections are, are higher than they have been in the past. Um, the other uh, major item uh, that I wanted to go over tonight um, with you all was um, where, where we left off last year with the Southeast area redistricting is that the committee was working to develop options to present to the Board of Education last fall. The Board of Education did hold two work sessions uh, late August, early September. They were presented options from the committee's report. Um, several of those options included a capital component, which was were additions to help reduce uh, the amount of students. One of the dilemmas the committee dealt with is um, the, the Eldersburg area schools were the schools that were uh, over utilized and the majority of the schools that we were in the um, committee that uh, really was uh, the, the majority of the seats that were available were in the Mount Airy, Pars Ridge, Mount Airy Elementary, Pars Ridge Elementary schools, which would have required a big shift of students from Eldersburg, pushing them all the way west into uh, Mount Airy, which would have moved a lot of students and really kind of changed feeder patterns and, and been pretty disruptive. So the committee came up with a couple options that look to add small, uh, you know, smaller additions uh, at a couple of targeted schools to help reduce the number of students we had to domino and push west. Um, the board got those options last fall and they had questions about how the additions would work or not work. They asked uh, staff to hire an architect to do a feasibility study to look at additions at Sykesville Middle and Freedom Elementary School. The architect completed the, the study in April, and then those studies were presented at last week's work session with the Board of Education. Uh, the this architect looked at a small addition at Freedom and a larger addition at Freedom. And the same thing for Sykesville. They looked at a four classroom addition and a 10 classroom addition at Sykesville Middle. Um, the Board of Education directed staff last week to include in, in the upcoming this year's facility master plan, which will go back to the board next week, actually. They asked staff to include the small addition at Freedom Elementary and the large addition at Sykesville Middle. Regarding the other schools that were uh, overutilized per board policy, 
because of all of the uncertainty right now with the blueprint legislation and how it's going to impact the operation of the school system, um, which you know could even you know if you've seen or or heard, read any articles about some of the impl implications is the potential is there where we might have to move staff from certain areas to the county to other areas of the county, you know, based on the way state funding flows to targeted populations. Um, there's with all of those questions, the board of education felt like doing any more looking at redistricting at this point with so many unknowns, uh, was not a good idea. They didn't want to disrupt the community, uh, and make any decisions, not knowing how the blueprint's going to actually impact how school, the school system operates. So at this point, the only thing moving forward really from the, the SARC committee and that process is the two additions to solve, uh, the, the overcrowding at freedom elementary and Sykesville middle, the other schools at this point are kind of on hold until we, till we see over the next year or so how blueprint and the operating budget is going to pan out. Um, Bill. That's kind of an update on SARC. Uh, I take a minute, take a break. <laughs> Any questions that you have? Yeah, I, I have one. Um, sure. What for freedom, what is the number of students that this edition is going to so the the it's a five classroom addition, so it would put um, the uh, capacity of freedom somewhere around 630, 630. So it 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 would handle the projected enrollment. Uh, so for the Freedom Elementary is projected to be 120 plus percent. I think the five classroom addition would bring the utilization down to close to 100 percent. I think. I think it's like 18 kids over capacity the projection if the projections hold so it'd be like 102 percent something like that um the 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 board considered the larger addition the, it would be a nine classroom addition the problem at freedom elementary is the site is so small yeah. that there was a lot of concern about um building a, uh, such a large addition would turn that school into one of the largest elementary schools in the county on one of the smallest sites, um, which could, would be problematic for, um, you know, the, the bus loop, parking, mm -hmm. parent drop off, all of those issues. So the board decided the smaller addition uh, would make more sense at that site. So. And is there a, target date for when all that'll so, happen so yeah so what good question them so the, the board directed us to include it in this year's facility master plan this this year's facility master plan is kind of the kicking off point for next year's uh, capital improvement plan request which uh, is kind of the implementation component of the 10-year facility plan so if, if it's going to go into the facility master plan this year and then in the FY25 capital budget, which the board will approve this fall and send to the county commissioners, uh, you know, uh, you know, in the fall after it's approved, we'll be asking for design funding to hire an architect to design it. Um, the commissioners would decide on the budget next May if they approve funding to hire an architect, we'd be hiring an architect to start next July. Now it takes about two years to, to plan a, a project school project, mainly to get through the development review process, the site plan review process. Um, we could probably design the building in, in a year, but you know, it's probably closer to 18 months to get the site plan through with all of the requirements for stormwater management, forest conservation, all of those things. So to play it safe, we would allow two years of planning. And then, you know, when it's ready, it'd be a year of construction, uh, you know, cause it's a small addition. It'd probably only take a year to build. So we're talking about starting next July, three years, down the road before it would open. Now they do have portable classrooms. They have six portable classrooms currently mm -hmm. on site that are handling 
uh, students today, and uh, they're they're um, currently. I can look it up right now. You're, you're so are, sorry, I, moved, I hit the mouse and muted myself. So I was just saying, Freedom's currently about um, 117 percent. So they're about 92 kids over their current capacity. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Would the Bill? Would the new uh, the five new classrooms eliminate the five uh, uh, portable classrooms? Yeah, the study that was done, that would be the plan is the, the addition would, uh, the addition would go in the, in the back, uh, but, and, you know, we wouldn't necessarily have to remove the portables, but the intent would be to do, to remove the portables to help with the bus loop and kind of the parking or drop off. I don't know if any of you have driven by and seen yeah. it during drop off or pick up, but it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a mess there. And there's not a whole lot we can do because the school's so close to the road, but, you know, if we move the portables, then we could try to help it out a little. Yeah, I saw, I went by today and saw, are those buses going to get in there? So, yeah. They get yeah. in, but only about three or four can make it at a time. On, yeah. On so. Yeah. So my question would be, if you remove the five portable classrooms and you just add five, you're really not extending your capacity at all, is that correct? Cor correct. It's the only, what we're doing is we're, it does change the utilization in the way the concurrency management and adequate public facilities ordinance looks at utilization and also the way the Board of Edu Education policy. So, uh, but, you know, because the portables don't count into capacity, the school's currently at 117 percent, 90 kids over. Obviously, they have seats. They're learning because they're in portable classrooms. So it's really just replacing temporary capacity with permanent capacity that can then be counted in, into to the building actual capacity. So, okay. anybody else? Okay, it's all yours. Bill. So just so you know, the next step is um, we planning will prepare a letter of consistency, the point of the educational facility master plan. And what Bill needs from this body is to make sure that it is consistent with the Carroll County master plan and the Freedom Community Comprehensive Plan. Um, so this will happen at the June 20th meeting. He'll be back before you. At that point in time, staff will have reviewed the document in its entirety and written the comment letter like we typically do, um, but that will be under Secretary Hines' signature and your signature. All right. So that concludes your report, Bill. Yeah. No, um, the only, I guess the only other thing I would highlight or point out is that um, we did change in Section 6 uh, the the need to modernize schools or renovate schools is another big you know facility need. We changed or we updated the scoring rubric for our modernizations. We included schools that were built in the 80s, whereas uh, before uh, we just looked at schools built prior to 19, uh, 1980. Um, but these new scores, Liberty High is now the next modernization in the 10-year calendar for. Uh, and when we say modernize, we mean fully, either fully renovate the school to bring it up to all current codes and, and instructional uh, models, or sometimes we do a replacement. Uh, typically, it starts as a modernization, and we do a feasibility study to look at whether it makes sense to replace or renovate. But Liberty High at this point has kind of jumped into the mix, and it's now the next uh, modernization. So that's that's a big change from previous years that I'd also highlight, but other than that, I think those are the big, those are the big changes really from, from what the, what was in the plan last year. Okay. All right. Any 
other questions for Bill? Nope. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Appreciate Thank you. It. Have a good night. You too. All righty. Item seven, concurrency management report. Laura Matthias, good evening. Good evening. If I could please share my screen. I do have a PowerPoint. There's not a huge wow factor to it. I'm glad I'm going before Brenda because hers is, has a little more uh, wow factor, but mine has some data that I'd like to share. All right. And are we good? Everybody can see that? Yes. Okay. Thank you for the, the verbal. All the people are a little really tiny now on my monitor, so you're you're all super small and the thank you for the verbal. Okay. Wonderful. So hopefully you all remember that I was before you last year and delivered the concurrency management report. This is because this is an annual report and chapter 156 of our code, which you are all familiar with, um, adequate public facilities and concurrency management is the actual title of that. It does charge us with creating an annual report. So you should all have received a copy of this in advance of tonight's meeting. I'm sure you read every word from start to finish. If you didn't, the highlights are on pages 4, 5, 26, and 27. So that gives you just a little, those are your, your cliff notes. Those are where the recommendations, the summary of the report lies. Um, so again, this is an annual report. Last year, I actually watched uh, the meetings from last year just the other day and found myself saying, like, next year, we're going to spin around on our heels and start right in, and we're going to deliver this a little bit earlier to you. Because the purpose of this report, it comes to the Planning and Zoning Commission to advise you. And then what my request is today is that we forward, that you all would forward the report to the Board of County Commissioners um, with a favorable recommendation and to include school data and student um enrollment productions from Bill Kane as well. And that then, the concurrency report um, goes to the Board of County Commissioners and it is to advise them in their decision-making process. Um, if there's anything in the CIP, which it sounds like uh, maybe next year we're heading towards that. So if there's any recommendations that come um, with this that are central to residential growth in Carroll County, okay? So that's the ask in front of you today. Okay. So again, just backing out, the purpose of this chapter of the code is to ensure that residential growth, and it's, this is in the county, okay, not municipalities. They have their own um, defi definition of levels of adequacy, okay? So this is just in the county to ensure that residential growth in the county does not strain our public facilities. So what does the, what do we, uh, what is subject to concurrency? And, and again, you know this, these plans are coming before you, the Planning and Zoning Commission. So we're talking about major subdivisions. We're talking about site plans for residential development. So this may be, um, most recently, Nell Dakers, right, was an age-restricted community. It was a site development plan, not a subdivision, but a development of a site for residential purposes, subject to concurrency. And mobile home parks as well fall under this chapter. What is exempt, what are exempt, um, the exemptions include off conveyances, minor subdivisions, which is three, three lots or less, commercial or industrial, and again, anything in the municipalities. And the facilities that we're testing would be schools, roads, water and sewer, police, fire and EMS. 
Again, you're more than familiar with this because it comes to you when you see a major subdivision for a review of a preliminary plan at that level, we're looking at concurrency. And then again, potentially again, at a final plan phase. So we do come and we say, we're looking for approval in accordance with chapter 155, development and subdivision and 156 concurrency. All right, so some numbers and data for this year. So the concurrency report for fiscal year 22. So the residential lots recorded, the top chart actually is approved by the Planning Commission. And you all know that uh, preliminary plan, moving to final plan, those numbers are not necessarily going to be the same because a preliminary plan you see within a fiscal year is probably going to be different than the final a, a final plan for a different subdivision that you're seeing. So these are different plans that are working their way through the process. So the Planning and Zoning Commission did approve 16 subdivisions in this fiscal year period, which included 45 lots. Okay. 28 of those were subject to concurrency. And then if we go down to the lots recorded, again, all the math isn't going to necessarily add up. Um, so the lots, when they get recorded, you are, all are very familiar as well with extension requests. We come before you and say, we had one, we had two extensions. That may very well be a subdivision that was approved it's received an extension. So once they finally move to recordation and record and create those lots, that is when we start to put these numbers in here. So new residential lots recorded in this fiscal year, we had 187 and 107 of those were in municipalities. Again, not subject to concurrency. Oh, it doesn't want to. There we go. Okay. Building permits. In the six year, so per the code, permits are not to exceed 6,000 on average in a six year period. We had 2,487 permits, residential permits, issued for the six-year fiscal period. So fiscal year 17 through 22, when you add up the numbers, we're seeing 2,487. We're nowhere near that 600, 6,000 um, permit cap that we're looking at in the code. So interesting. I think these numbers are a little interesting when we talk about um, maybe a, a lag or a lull in construction um, because of COVID years, right? So we saw like a drop in 2020, bounce back in 2021, and now we're kind of evening out to what we were seeing before all that. So I, th I found that kind of interesting in general. Um, so I will, no, I won't. I was going to stop screen stop. Stop sharing. Okay, so those those were some of the numbers. Um, again, on page four and five is where you see the summary and the recommendations. And Mr. Kane already covered. He went over schools, and what we are seeing is that you know freedom. Oh, that's not good. Telling me to sorry. Excuse me. I don't know if anyone saw that except me. It's telling me to plug in my PC, which is already plugged in, so I'm not sure what that's about. Hopefully, I won't just disappear. <laughs> so Freedom Elementary School, this is a projected inadequacy beginning in fiscal year 24. That is like the um, little, little red flag with the schools right now, and we, we already knew that. Um, Mr. Kane talked about it, and he also talked about how the, the – development of the committee, the Southern Area or District and Committee, the recommendations that meeting in front of the Board of Ed last week was very key and it, it gives us 
kind of an idea of how they're going to be moving forward, when that may happen, and the time frame for that. So those are all very important things. And we are looking from a county perspective, we're hopeful that once that plan gets put in place, when we solidify that plan, that our uh, Board of County Commissioners will consider at what point that will be mitigation, which is considered acceptable to the county that we can move forward with the approval that you all can move forward with the approval of plans that are coming through in the freedom area. Okay, so schools was a highlight. Um, our fire and emergency services also is something to just, and regularly we do see um, the category of approaching inadequate per the thresholds in chapter 156 for fire services. Um, so this year we were down a little bit. We had eight that were approaching inadequate. Last year there were nine. So we're looking at like the question is how do you address that, right? So we do have a new right director of fire and emergency services. Um, we also are looking to have paid personnel, right? Uh, it was my understanding from a meeting this morning, we're onboarding 70 people tomorrow and most of those are in fire and emergency services so we're upping the staffing the paid personnel um, and in consideration as well of automatic sprinklers we're hoping that conversation continues with our this director and CC visa as to looking at thresholds um, and maybe adjusting thresholds um, response time measures. So, so those are the highlights from this year's report. Like I said, it does contain a lot of data as to what all plans you were approved, um, how many off conveyances were approved in the county, and all of the threshold measures are in the report as well. So it's it's wonderful reading if you have a chance but if not use those those key pages that i gave you um so again i we are looking for a request just the request just to forward this to the board of county commissioners and i believe that uh, the department of planning has put a letter together her regards for you do you have questions for me do you need that recommendation tonight um or next meeting i i it would be preferable tonight but if you okay. felt a need to come back for some reason uh i'm certainly happy to do so i don't um i don't know about the other gentlemen and i do see that mr Ralph Robertson has joined us, although I can't see him. If you could turn your camera on, then we can see you as well. Um, but um, so who wants to take a stab at a motion? I'll take a shot. But before I do, Laura, a couple questions. The municipalities are exempt from concurrency. They have their own concurrency, I'm assuming, right? And is that modeled after the county concern? Con concurrency models, you know, for capacity that's, for that's a, that's a great question, right? So we're they're not subject to our concurrency. What they are each utilizing, not utilizing, I do not no i will say that we count all of those numbers um because we then are providing bill kane the all of the what's coming right that's all included in his projections so we count the numbers but it's not subject to our concurrency gotcha yeah okay so that's good for me to know good for everybody to know the the uh the other question the those um, projects that are not counted, um, you know, that come through the, the process of, of uh, plan developments and things like that, that we see there's the, the number of ha homes or units or whatever that's going to impact. And um, 
And then there's these sidebar things, bad word, but, uh, you know, you see single family homes being built one, two over here, a couple over there that aren't in municipalities. Are they included in the concurrency numbers eventually? Because they would affect schools, they would affect fire, they would affect police. Are they? How are they accounted for? So, so again, one one hundred and fifty six outlines what is exempt and what is included. So, anything that comes through that is a major subdivision, four lots or more, is going to be subject to concurrency. If it's minor, three lots or less, it's not. And you have to remember with that, you've seen this plenty of times where we go all the way back to the beginnings of that parcel's history. So if you've created 20 lots and now you're coming in for another one lot, then you're still a major subdivision, right? You've already done 20 lots. We're looking at those 20 lots plus that one lot, okay? And you, you've seen those. We, we brought those in front of you and, and explained that for sure. Um, so does that, does that answer your question as to what is and what isn't subject? Well, I, I'm, I'm thinking uh, uh, just around the corner from me, there's um, on Case Mill Road, there's two individual homes that have been built the last you know, 16, 18 months obviously don't meet the you know the number requirement to go through concurrency but they do add to the number uh with in terms of school potentially fire response that or how are they accounted for those onesie twosies right so those are not subject to chapter 156 so they don't now is bill kane still on mm, i'm no. not sure he is He's great gone. So, but he has, he uses our numbers plus, which I think he did touch on tonight too, right? He has like birth rates and projected, you know, who's coming into kindergarten. He's, he's got census data. He has all sorts of that kind of information that he's utilizing for the school's portion of it. But in terms of one, two or three lots here or there or there, they don't fall under our chapter 156. Okay. All right. I have a quick question. So once um, they've all gone through the review and it comes up to concurrency management, say for instance, fire was okay and then by the time it's going to final, it is approaching inadequate or inadequate um, does that hold them back? So the code very clearly outlines, right, what your authorities are. So I'm just going to use the Mineral Hill subdivision as a good example. Now that was 14 lots, but you saw that very recently. And the schools, because the schools were inadequate, right, the, the code lays out you cannot, you do not have the authority to approve. You must disapprove this, right? So it, so it, if it's inadequate at that point in time, then you must disapprove, right? If we're talking about a preliminary plan early on, we do test it and it will not prevent it from moving forward to a final plan review stage but when the final comes before you for approval something has to have turned around or else you're in the same the code will tell you you can't cannot if it's inadequate okay. does that make sense yeah so if mm -hmm. it that, that's was okay best example and then goes bad it's the same apply by the time it's final so the code does uh if at preliminary everything is all good it doesn't it does okay sorry my screen up um it it doesn't have to be retested at final we just we so that is laid out in the code too so you're really looking at that final approval stage and if everything was okay and is okay now okay 
Okay. And this is the report for uh, fiscal year ending uh, June 30, 2022, right? That's the package. Yes, so it's, so yes, it's the just a, a, a summary report of, 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 you know, last year's activities in effect. Yeah. Okay. Michael, there's a um, note on the bottom of 27 that may help you with your Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Uh, that that I, was a good, good idea. I want Laura to know I did. I read through the whole thing, maybe skimmed some of it, but I did read through it, and I did see that on page twenty-seven, and I'm, I turned to page twenty-seven, knowing that's where that verbiage was. So I'll, I'll make a motion uh, that the um, Carroll County Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, forward the concurrency management report to the board. I guess I should say the concurrency management report fiscal year 2022 to the board of county commissioners with a favorable recommendation and including school data and student, student population projections from Mr. King. I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Mr. Robinson, can you um, undo your microphone and just give us an affirmative or a negative, or if you can turn your camera on just so we can record your vote, or else we're going to have to account it as um, an abstention. Okay, I'll vote, vote. I'll vote affirmative. Okay, thank you. And the camera I'm having trouble with here. Okay. Thank you for letting us know. All right. Okay. Um, then it's approved and Laura, you have your, okay. So that's Thank one you. favor and the motion carries and I will go ahead and forward that to you, Madam Chair, for um, your signature and we'll send it to them. I'll have that to you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Great. Thank you all. And thank you, Mr. Kane, for reading it. You and Chris Hine can compare your notes. He read the whole thing too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, next up is the Community Solar in Agricultural District. Brenda, I believe that's you. Yep, so that's Miss Denny. Um, just a little bit of background. So as you all may be aware that the um, Board of County Commissioners have a six-month moratorium um, on our community solar in the agricultural zone only regular solar on commercial and industrial rooftop mounted all of that stuff is still moving forward there's no moratorium on that but part of the process is whenever we do a text amendment and that's what's being proposed here um, is that the commissioners are sending to you a text amendment for the agricultural zoning uh, district specifically for community solar so the idea of tonight is for um, Brenda to go ahead and talk with you about what the work group came up with as part of that moratorium process, what the Board of County Commissioners um, think should be the motion moving forward, or what to do moving forward, and then for your recommendation to send back to them for their discussion and decision. So it will not need to come back to you all again unless you feel that you want to have more time to discuss and make other um, recommendations. However, um, the, this needs to be taken care of um, within the next several meetings in order to meet the deadline of the moratorium. So with that, I'm going to forward it to um, Brenda. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. And can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right, good. Um, Linda um, stole some of my thunder, so I'm going to repeat it anyway <laughs> because it's in my presentation. Um, so uh, as Linda said, we're here tonight, and I, I know you have a full agenda, so this could possibly be quicker than you would. Um, we're here tonight just to go over the direction from the Board of County Commissioners on community solar in the agricultural zone. Um, and if you recall, I, I believe you're all here, except for possibly Ralph. Um, 
you were all here when I briefed you on March 29th, so um, you already have some background on what, what this is about. So, um, just a quick reminder that you know, what we're talking about is community solar. That community solar is a commercial operation. Um, it is a solar energy generating system that is a subscription based. So one or more households would share it. And it doesn't have to be on their property, but you subscribe to a certain amount of power and then it credits to your bill. Uh, so the purpose of it really is to provide um, the opportunity to benefit from solar power without having it on your property. So currently, Brenda, can I interrupt for just a second? Um, yeah. What you're yeah. displaying has a little um, icon over it. Give titles a try. If you can turn that off. Oh. Hmm. It only gives me the option to turn it on. Oh, there we go. There, perfect. Sorry Thank that. you. I'm seeing my, my, power, my presentation in two different places, so I'm not really sure which one you guys are seeing. Um, so currently, uh, community solar is allowed, as Linda said, in the commercial zoning district, and, or at least most of them, and in the industrial zoning district, uh, because it is a commercial operation. What we're talking about here is strictly the community solar facilities that are allowed in, on certain parcels in the agricultural zone. So in May of 2021, the previous board adopted an amendment that would allow the community solar facilities on um, certain parcels in the agricultural zone. And let me just flip to that with those. Um, I'll come back to this one, but um, the current code allows uh, community solar facilities at, to, at a cap of two megawatts. Um, I'm not going to like go into this in detail, but this is just a quick overview. Um, they can't take more than 20 acres on a parcel. The conservation easement is required for the part that's not in, in solar. Um, you have, you'd have to have a site plan, of course, is required, and we go to the Planning Commission. No topsoil removed, no impact to environmental resources. Um, but they're calling agrivoltaics now is required, which would co-locate the solar and agricultural activities. Um, landscape buffers required, 40-foot setback, 15-foot height limit, Underground utilities and a decommissioning plan and bond are required as part of um, the current requirements that are in place. So going back, um, so those those things were put in place in May of 2021. The first um, plan was submitted to development review on April 28th of 2022. So since that time, we currently have seven plans that have been submitted. Um, none of them. Have have gone farther than technical review committee, which means none of them have come as far as uh, going in front of the planning commission yet. So in March, the current Board of County Commissioners adopted a six month moratorium. And the moratorium was on the processing, review, permitting, and construction of the community solar facilities, specifically in the agricultural zone. At that time, uh, the board directed the staff to review the applicability or specifically for community solar and ag. You know, so that's what we were looking at, just that. Um, look at certain issues and requirements that were identified by the board, and then also to form a work group that could review these things with us and provide feedback on the concerns and, and options that were available. And the board, uh, based on you know, the board's direction, that work group had two members of the ag community that were opposed. And um, specifically, they asked us to have members of the Carroll County Farm Bureau as those representatives. We had two members um, that were owners of properties adjacent to a proposed community solar facility. And then we had a representative from the solar industry who they did not want to be a member. Um, someone who had a current proposed project in the county. 
and then also a property owner who had a post project on their property. And then we had staff from planning, development review, and zoning to help um, provide information on the discussion through that process. So between April 11th and May 1st, the work group met four times in almost 16 hours worth of meeting. Um, and then after that point, the, we developed a um, draft work staff report and sent it back to the work group to review and get comment on. And then we sent on May 16th the final staff report to the board for their review. May 18th, the board had a work session um, with Mr. Hine and um, had some discussion. And the direction from the board at that time was that they want to remove uh, community solar as a permitted use in the agricultural zone. Nothing to do with commercial industrial, just um, what's currently in for allowing it in agricultural zone. So you may ask, why are we here? But you probably already know, because you're not new to the Planning Commission. And Ralph has been around long enough. He probably knows anyway. Um, so even though the commissioners have already you know, said that they want to remove it from the zoning code, under the zoning code itself, it says we have to come to the Planning Commission when there is going to be a proposed change to the zoning code or a map. So we are here tonight to um, let you, you know, to tell you that that was what the board's direction was and to then request uh, direction from you, I mean, a recommendation from you, whether you would like to support the board's direction or whether you want to recommend keeping community solar as a permitted use in the ag zone. Um, it, like I said, it, the board's already said what they want to do, so you know we're not necessarily looking for the planning commission to uh, discuss what the individual requirements are or should be. Um, but you know, there, what, what approach do you want to take? Would you like to? That's that's the discussion. Would you like to support it or, or recommend keeping it? And if you do want to keep it, then maybe the discussion would be, why would you want to keep it so that we can include that in what goes back to the board? Oh, uh, this so, is Matt. I, st I still have the same question I've had all along. Uh, I was told before that one of the issues is, is that the state has a mandate for solar, and it's they said it applied to individual counties. And what happens to the county if we never meet that mandate? Could the state override the county code? I mean, the big thing as a farmer, you know, we worry about is whole farms going into solar panels like every other county in the state that has two, you know, 100, 200 acre solar projects. And that's what everybody really opposes. So how, how does the state have that power to override the county if we never meet the mandate? So the, the answer to that is complicated. <laughs> there, there is not currently a requirement that the county have any certain amount of solar. The state has its own um, goal for meeting certain um, amounts of the energy generated with a certain amount of renewable energy. There isn't any current mandate, though, that we have a certain amount. But what has happened is Several times in the past couple years, the General Assembly has reviewed legislation that proposed that that, that happened. It hasn't passed yet, but that it has been proposed and discussed um, by the legislature several times now. Uh, the other the other issue, so that that's in terms of a state mandate, that's where that is. Um, but the other issue is the Maryland Public Service Commission, and they are the ones who Prove uh, these types of facilities, it, um, and so they do have the authority to approve something, even if the local jurisdiction doesn't want it. I mean, if it doesn't follow our requirements, they can still approve it, and and that that's like where more of the con you know more current controversy lies. Um, it's not. Like so that we could get a mandate at some point in the future, but currently the, that is the issue is, and there's been court cases to say that the Maryland Public Service Commission, you know, could, you know, they are, 
the solar companies could go back to them and say, um, you know, I, I want to get a certificate of public convenience and necessity and, you know, get this approved and the Public Service Commission could consider what the, what the local jurisdiction has in their zoning, but they can override it. Does that answer your question? Brenda, this is Ralph Robertson. Um, there's a little bit more to it than that, and that is a Public Service Commission can do that if they feel like there's a, an immediate need for something, for extra power or a community that, that is maybe short on power or an area. I'm not too sure that they can just come in and wholesale override um, zoning or local um, county ordinances in this case without a pretty good fight on their hands. So, I mean, I think we might need to look into that a little bit farther. So if we vote to support the board direction, then any, any agricultural um, is going to be banned from doing that. And that right. is Cur correct. Currently, yeah, currently the, even without, if, if this gets removed from the zoning code, the only solar that you should be seeing in the agricultural zone is accessory solar, which isn't considered commercial and, and that's allowed. Um, so yeah, if, if the board, you know, you're going to make a recommendation to the board, the board will consider your recommendation, but ultimately they can still decide what direction to go, even if it's not the same as what you recommended. Um, so if they remove it, then it would only be allowed in our zoning under commercial and industrial. Okay. So, so the people that currently have them, they're um, have been through technical review, um, they would need to just scrap the entire thing, correct? If the board does not decide to grandfather those um, projects, then yes. So is that something they are considering? I don't think it's been brought up for discussion in open session yet. So uh, I'm not sure. You know, Chris, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Commissioner Gordon, but uh, I don't believe that it has been discussed yet at all. Yeah, no, it has not been discussed. Um, but knowing the direction that the commissioners are leaning and that they do not want community solar and ag, I would frankly be shocked if they grandfathered um, the projects that are that are in process. But I can't speak for the commissioners, but. Um, that would be my assumption. Commissioner Gordon. I'll just uh, jump in for a quick second. Um, given the context of the conversation on solar and ag, um, that is correct. The, uh, the general opinion of the board as a whole is that we're not looking for it in any fashion of putting community solar within ag and that uh, we would not be grandfathering in any uh, current uh, proposals that have been uh, submitted. Okay. Thank you. Um, just, just for clarification, I, I seem to recall that the the, um, the 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 residual parcels were what this was limited to, not all of uh, ag. But I guess now we're we're being asked to, or the, the the you know, because of the feedback from the community, it's being uh, elevated to to include all of agriculture, of land. Is that correct? No. Uh, well, you you are correct in that only certain parcels in the agricultural zone uh, were eligible for community solar to be developed, and that was on remaining portions. So, you know, just generally speaking, the remaining portions are. Is, is the land that's left over on a parcel after the residential development rights have been taken and or even if some of them have been taken and some are left you've got 
that's the re so some remaining portions may have some development rights left. We had about two thirds of the remaining portions did not have any um, remaining residential development rights. So it was limited in the agricultural zone to only the remaining portions. So and this does not in any way expand it to looking at the rest of the agricultural zone if if we're removing it in in its current form. Does that answer your question? I'm still confused. So it's 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 just for residual por por portions. It's not remaining portions, right? Right. It's not allowed currently on any other agricultural parcels except for remaining portions that existed as of July first, twenty twenty. Can we can we clean up the language on these a little bit? The community solar and agricultural zone. It should just be remaining portions. Of units. Agricultural zone sounds like you know, the whole right. everything. That that's the language that's used in the zoning code. Um, so that's why it's written that way. It, it actually says key solar energy generating systems in the agricultural zone. So like I said, that's why it's written that way. But those it, specifies in the requirements in that section of the code that it's only on remaining portions. So if we move the whole piece, you know, it doesn't affect any other parcels in the ag zone. So the bottom line is no solar in any portion of ag. Correct. No commercial solar. I mean, you know, farms can still use have accessory solar, which is meant to only serve their farm. But, but, but yes, all commercial. There wouldn't be any commercial at all in the agricultural zone. It's just a thing that. Okay. All right. Matt, do you have something? Uh, I was going to comment. You know, the other thing is, is you know, it is a right that they're taking back away but i guess they never did have it and the poor seven people that applied for it are not going to probably get it unless they grandfather them in so uh i just i, I don't totally agree with it but yeah you know because it is, it is a landowner right and i think it's something that unless something magical changes about solar uh we're going to end up dealing with much larger projects in the future so just a couple things. So I think you just made a good point there, um, Mr. Hall. You know, the wording up here is for two different things, support board direction or recommend keeping it as is. But there are other options. You could make other recommendations, and maybe one of the recommendations is and grandfather. And so, so support the board's direction, but grandfather on projects and process. I mean, that is entirely up to this body to make a different recommendation than what's listed here. And I would also suggest, um, and I would like uh, our attorney to weigh in on this, Mr. Ahmed, if, uh, Mr. Robertson, since he was part of the work group, if he should be recusing himself from the discussion after the motion's been made. Um, I think that would be appropriate. I'd like to okay. remind you, sir, though, that the, there was no recommendation that came out of that report. Well, it, the report, the report future, itself was um, just I noise. I'm giving the advice that, you know, I can as the attorney for the board. Okay. I, I, I believe, Ralph, you can um, speak your thoughts now, but um, we're talking about if the commission makes a recommendation. Is that correct, Linda? That is correct. I, I believe my understanding would be, and I would, again, have um, Mr. Allman weigh in, that once the motion has been made and you call for discussion after that motion, that would be the time then um, for, for recusal and not to vote, um, recuse yourself from the vote. Okay. Yeah, that's what I've, I've had that many times myself. Um, okay, great gentlemen, thoughts? Stephen? 
I mean, I, I definitely agree with what Matt is saying a lot. Um, you know, and obviously in this political climate with a lot of the green energy initiatives, um, you know, like you said, I mean, I certainly want to make sure that, you know, you can't just come in, like I said, with a, you know, 200 acre solar, you know, solar project. So. Well, I do think it was limited in size, correct, Brenda? Right. The, well, the current, um, current code requirements acted at two megawatts, which is, and then and then the amount that's the energy generated, and then the actual amount of space it took on the land was limited to and capped at twenty acres, to include everything associated, such as the um, the fence, the landscape, the access road, all of that needed to be included. In Excuse me, if I can just interject and, and to what um, I think this might answer your question, um, Mr. Smith, is this is only for community solar. This does not preclude an energy company coming in and doing a large scale solar facility. It's This only controls the smaller scale. The county has the ability for community solar to regulate location. Once it is over that megawattage, then we do not have that ability. We lose our local land use autonomy when it comes to siting. We still retain the ability for different um, bulk requirements and landscaping, but this is specifically for community solar, which is the smaller solar, which we have the ability to determine location on. But energy generating beyond that community solar megawattage, that is under the control of the Public Service Commission. So you would not be changing those types of projects. They can still go forward um, in the ad zone. Okay, understood, so understood. Somebody that has a 100 acre farm that um, a company wanted to come in and do what you're saying could be done. If they could get approval from the Maryland Public Service Commission, then yes. Okay. Yeah, but, okay. but currently, the but currently the county code only allows a commercial solar on commercial ground or industrial, doesn't it? It, it doesn't well, matter. It's a, right. That's a community solar, but not what Linda was just talking about. Am so I even correct? though we've made allowances in our zoning district for. Um, utility and, and energy generating, um, regardless of size in the commercial zones, at certain commercial zones and the um, industrial zone, right? You, you can do that within, with any small or large, doesn't matter in those districts. But outside of a certain megawattage, the energy generating larger scale, again, local land use authority and zoning does not apply. They can cite that anywhere that the Public Service Commission, it's a rigorous process. So I don't want to make it seem like the Public Service Commission rubber stamps things, but if they determine a need and they determine the site is appropriate and they go through their public hearing process, then they will let that energy um, or that utility move forward with a project. Okay. And, and I think just to clarify, the community solar, we're capping it at two megawatts here. The state cap is five megawatts. So I think some of the concern that was expressed is that um, uh, one of these de solar developers could decide they're going to increase the size of their project. You need a certificate of public convenience and necessity from the Public Service Commission for anything over two megawatts. So they could, what, you know, the thought is they could increase the size of their community solar project, requiring them to get a Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity, or CPCN, and then the Public Service Commission would be able to approve even a community solar facility. So that was some of the discussion that, you know, may be confusing things too, because there is an, a possibility of community solar being approved by the Public Service Commission if they go with a larger size than what we cap it at. Now, if they'll do that or not is a different question, but they have the authority to do that. I don't believe that they try 
to override the local jurisdiction mm -hmm. you know, on a regular basis. So if somebody wanted to, they would have the right then to be able to try to do that on right. a larger scale. Okay. Right. Everybody got that? Matt, I see your... Yeah, I'm I'm unmuted, but I don't have any more comment on it. Okay. Um, so, do we need to give you a response tonight? Is that your ask? Uh, if if you believe you can, you know, you know, decide as the commission tonight what direction you'd like to recommend, and you know, we're certainly open to doing that. Um, otherwise. Uh, if you need more time, we can also come back to you as well. Um, ultimately, we'll be looking for, you know, if you, whatever your recommendation is, you know, if it's not to support the board decision, then, you know, you might want to have discussion, too, as, in terms of what you want to include in your recommendation to the board as to why you want to make the recommendation that you do. Okay. I, I think... Um, I don't get a vote at the moment on that. So, um, but I welcome a motion or somebody to say, I'd rather wait until the next meeting, discuss some more, um, open. Uh, Ma'am, can I make a comment? Yes, you can. Um, I would be very reluctant to make a recommendation now if you open the door to those two particular projects that were were not even in the pipeline yet um, I think the ramifications of that are much greater than we might perceive them to be that's the only cautionary thing I can say at this point uh, were they part of the technical review that had they have they already been through that i think staff can answer that better than i can which two are you referring to ralph there were two projects that chris projects that there were two projects that Chris kept referring to as farther along than the other, than the other, than the seven. And um, I don't have the paperwork in front of me here, uh, had gobs of it, but uh, there were two projects that were a little bit farther along than the others, uh, almost to the point of submitting them. And uh, but I, I would I would be very caution, put a cautionary uh, point on this, to you know jumping into the fray here, and making a recommendation to accept the two or the seven or, or whichever ones you're talking about here. I don't have that paper in front of me, but uh, I think we're a little premature on this. Um, I just got uh, I was privy to a report out of a another jurisdiction that had a 10 page or ordinance that uh, Commissioner Garon referred to um, a, 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 a municipality a county down next to Mecklenburg County in North Carolina they're, they're grappling with the same thing they came up with a 10 page ordinance that just dealt with this um, so I, I just think we're a little premature on this I think we're getting the, the we might be throwing the baby out with the wash water here um, in this Are whole you process. Specifically? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Are, are you referring specifically to a recommendation from the Planning Commission regarding the grandfathering? I am. Okay. You, you don't mean necessarily whether the supporter recommend keeping it, but the grandfathering portion of it. I'm talking about grandfathering, yes. I um, needed to clarify. Is is um, I think I think I fall on the side of property rights 
no matter what they are. And I think, I feel like we are not quite ready to make a decision. Am I reading you all correctly? Uh, yes, Mr. Matt, I'd like to table it to another meeting. Michael? Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm in agreement. I think that we need to discuss this a little bit further. Uh, it's a hot topic, no question. We saw the tremendous community uh, response to uh, the commissioner's uh, public meetings. Um, the, the issue with uh, setback has always been concern of the, our, uh, our board. Um, 40 feet isn't, to me, you know, just picking on the setback, that's just not enough. 40 feet is, hell, it's nothing uh, for these things. And the aesthetics is really what gets the community in an uproar, I think. The, the um, we, I think we also, on the other side, we all understand that, look, this is the future. Um, and the grid, the power grid, the current grid um, is, you know, from what we read and see is not sustainable. Um, the other side, if there's three sides, um, <laughs> technology advancements are fantastic. Uh, the solar panel of today probably will be the size of a 19 inch TV <laughs> in five or 10 years. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff here and I, I agree. I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we should table this for, for another time, but I need to get more information. Okay. Steven, are you in agreement? Uh, yeah. uh, 100% in agreement. I, I think that, uh, like you said, there's there's just a lot of moving parts to it right now, and we need to do everything we can to make sure we, we get it right. Okay. Okay. So well, I can... Yes, go ahead, Chris. Sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, if I could just ask, we, we'd be more than happy to bring this back um, before you for a further discussion. Is there any additional information that we can provide to you in the interim to help you with the discussion? Um, one concern that I had, just thinking back, uh, uh, you know, it was something different, but I think down in uh, Lower Carroll County, there was a lawsuit that came back against the county that cost the county a lot of money because they kind of allowed something and then they changed their mind at the at, at some point along the line that uh, was very costly to the county probably what well, five or ten years ago I think um, could something like that happen with this with the people that are farther along and have spent a lot of money already so I can answer that so um... Uh, Maryland as a state is what's considered a late vesting um, state, which means that uh, a, a developer is not fully vested in their project until they put shovel in the ground is one way to think about it. So um, sure, anybody can sue for anything, but, um, but as a policy, uh, Maryland is a late vesting, so there's not an, uh, that vesting does not occur until all approvals have been achieved and the shovel goes on the ground. Um, okay, I, I hear what you say, but you are right. Anybody can sue for anything, which then, of course, drags things to another level. So um, I think we all agree that we want to um, wait and discuss it next. So, but it took, Janet, if I could. Uh, sure. One of the where did where are the uh, the standards? It seems like we're operating from standards that were developed somewhere. The fifteen foot height. Where is that a is, to answer your it's question? Really, really need more information right. or something you can help with that. Where does that fifteen foot that? come from? Where does the forty foot setback setback come from? Is that from the solar companies saying their recommendations? Is it? What kind of research is a research based? 
that would help, I think, sure. our comments. Yeah, so, so if they, I can, they, I'm sorry, yeah. Brenda, if, if I, I'm, I'm sorry. So, um, so what you're referring to is what's in the current code, what's in, right. in 158, 153E as part of the, the county code. And, and just to, to clarify again for everybody, um, we're not looking for um, the commission to come up with recommendations on changes to that code. Really, it's just an up or down yes or no. Do you agree with the county commissioner's desire to remove that section of the code, which allows community solar, commercial type solar on ag remaining portions? So that's really the only decision that we're looking from you all. If you say, yes, we agree that this should be removed, that's the extent of the information we need. If you feel that no community solar does belong on the ag, in the ag district, um, you can provide that as a response to the Board of County Commissioners with some reasons why. Um, so that's really the only discussion or the only answer we're looking for. Um, the commissioners have, have expressed um, that their, de their desire is to remove the code. So getting into the details of you like this setback or that setback or any of that, it's kind of a moot point. Um, it's really an up or down type support or, or offer a differing opinion to the county commissioners. So hopefully that clarifies things for everybody. Yeah, okay. I, I um, understand that, but that's a little contrary to what Linda said. She did say there was an option about the grandfather and if that's what we thought. So that, that I think is where um, the members are having a little bit of trouble grappling with this. So. Understood, understood, yes. Okay. All right. Okay, well, thank you, Brenda, for your presentation. And um, I suspect we will see you in a few weeks. So. I suspect you will. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, next up is the economic development and land use study. I believe Linda and um, Andrew. Yes. Um, so as you have uh, been seen periodically, we've been coming before you just updating you on the economic and development land use study that planning is working on as part of its preparation for the next general development plan. Um, so with us this evening are consultants, Martin Smith, Ben Valentine, and Jordan Howard to go over with you the most recent findings from our public participation efforts, our different focus groups and interviews. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our consulting team to present all of that information to you. Uh, and I think Drew has a beginning part of a presentation he would like to start. So Drew, if you could share your screen with that, that would be great. Yeah, so if the control room will let me have access to sharing my screen. All right, um, just to go over real brief before I hand it over to our consultants, the economic development and land use study, this has come before you uh, once before. It's been to the county commissioners a couple times from Department of Planning, Linda and myself, Paige from Department of Economic Development, and then a county consultant, with Courtney Powell, Martin Smith, Erica and Ben, and newly added is um, the team from uh, John Stover and Associates, uh, John, Leslie, and Jordan. Um, a couple of them are on the call. And that is all I have, Linda. I will um, turn it over to Martin. Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, first off, I wanted to take a, a quick moment to thank Linda for all of her hard work with this project. Uh, we are very, very sad to hear that you are are going to be shifting into a new position, but I'm I'm sure that you're going to, to be great wherever it is that you, you end up. Um, 
I wanted to also make sure that I thank Andrew and Paige for all of the work that they've done with this project as well. They've they've really been invaluable in in making this a much easier process. Uh, I am joined on the call by Ben Valente uh, and by Jordan from JSNA. Um, if we have any specific questions, they'll be available right afterwards to uh, answer any of those that, that may arise. Uh, and for those of you who were here previously uh, and remember Courtney Powell from WGI as the one who was uh, presenting as the project manager at that point in time, uh, I wanted to let you guys know that she is out on family leave right now. She uh, had a, a beautiful baby girl a couple of weeks ago, uh, and we expect her to come back within the next few weeks. Uh, so when she does get back, she'll be resuming as the, the PM on the project. So if you notice, there's a little uh, transition there. Uh, I just wanted to make sure everyone had a heads up on that. Um, let's go on, Andrew, to the next slide. Uh, okay, so uh, this is is just a quick recap. I know that there's some new folks on the uh, Planning and Zoning Committee, uh, so I wanted to give everyone an opportunity to see what it is that we're working on. As Andrew and Linda had both said, uh, this is a precursor to the 2025 General Development Plan. Uh, so what we're really looking at right now are what are some of the existing conditions in Carroll County? Uh, how does that relate to some of the peer counties around you guys? Uh, where are some of the opportunities that you guys can explore further in that 2025 general uh, development plan? So we're really uh, putting together that baseline assessment right now on uh, what some of some of your existing options or some of your existing conditions are on what some of your future options are going to be. Uh, Andrew, next slide. Okay, so where are we on the project timeline? Uh, we got started with the project last fall uh, in October. We are right now in the draft economic development and land use study phase of the, the process. Um, we have done a uh, significant data collection component um, to public open houses, which we'll talk about a little bit more in just a moment. Uh, and we have been drafting all of the different segments of the, the report as we've been going along. We've been getting some really great feedback uh, from Linda and Paige and Andrew and their teams. And we are now compiling all of that into a complete document. Uh, we will be producing the draft document uh, to uh, Linda's team within the next couple of weeks. Uh, and then I believe we are scheduled to come back before the, the PZC in, Andrew, do you know when, when that is? Is that August or September? I will get back in touch with you. I don't know the specific date off the top of my head. It may be in August, um, but okay. I'll, I'll look and, and we can get back to everyone on that, Martin. Okay. Uh, but at a one of your future meetings, we will be coming back and uh, talking with you guys about the final component. Uh, so I hope that you will all take the opportunity to read through everything that we are, are putting together before we get to that next meeting. Uh, let's jump on to our next slide. So what have we gotten done so far and, and what still remains? Uh, phase one, we went through the communications plan, the project management plan. Uh, we developed the brand for the, the project, uh, did a countywide site visit tour and our first public open house. Uh, phase two, we did a series of stakeholder interviews. We also had some small focus groups. Uh, and then we have been working on the asset mapping, the peer benchmarking assessment, legal and regulatory, and the demographic zoning and land use analysis. Uh, phase three is going to be compiling all of these things into the draft document, uh, getting some feedback internally from the department at that point. Uh, and then there will be a public comment period, and then we'll be producing a finalized version of that document uh, at the very end of the project. Let's go on to the next one. So what public engagement has occurred to date? Uh, we have had 13 key stakeholder interviews, 
three focus groups, uh, the business climate survey, two open house surveys, a student survey, uh, and a total of 345 participants in that part of the project. Um, what we uh, don't have included in that number are all of the uh, various different one-on-one -on -one conversations that we've had uh, through emails and phones and, and Teams calls uh, with specific individuals who, who we brought in to handle particular components of the project. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. So what was at uh, public open house number one? Uh, the first public open house was back in February. Um, and the objective there was really to see from a citizen perspective in the county, what are the assets that they see as, as significant and of great value to the community? Uh, where are some of those opportunities that they perceive? Um, we achieved that through dot voting and through some mapping exercises. Uh, and the results of that were, were something that was consistent with what, what we expected. Um, the number one asset that everyone uh, said that Carroll County had was your small business community. And the number two asset was your open space and recreational opportunities. Uh, and those are, are things that we certainly expected we would see with a, a community with uh, Carroll County's um, assets and, and <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know, specific features and, and demographics. Uh, let's go on into our next slide here. Uh, public open house number two was in late April. <clears throat> and this one took a slightly different uh, approach. We wanted to really kind of zero in on some of those economic development components. Uh, and so our team came up with um, sort of a monopoly themed uh, series of presentation boards that were very popular. Uh, there were 11 of those boards that were all industry specific. And what we wanted to talk about with that was a general summary of that industry, uh, what the future of that industry might look like in Carroll County moving forward, what some of the opportunities were and what some of the considerations were. Uh, all of the participants were given $120 in monopoly money that they were allowed to spend or invest in the different industries, uh, depending on which ones they would like to see more of, about the same, uh, or less of. Uh, and what we saw there was actually very interesting, if we can jump into the next slide. So these are the number of votes by industry. Uh, and the slide after this, we'll talk about the dollar amount. So people had the option with each of these different boards to either invest a $20 bill, a $10 bill, or a $5 bill. The $20 bills is the dark green that you see down at the very bottom. Uh, the $10 is that medium green, and the $5 is that uh, lighter colored green. And we saw a, consistent with public open house number one, a substantial preference for small business incubation as one of the key economic development drivers that the citizens really wanted to see more of uh, within Carroll County. And that's something that we saw both by votes and on the next slide in just a second, you'll see also by the total amount invested. Um, agricultural production was a very close second. Ag tech was a very close third. Uh, and then towards the uh, lower end were things like defense contracting, biotech, uh, drones, uh, distribution warehousing, things along those lines. Um, but one thing that was interesting was that there was a level of support for all of these different uh, industries. It's just obviously that some people preferred certain ones over others. So let's go on into our next one here. Uh, so this is looking at the, the amount of total votes by the dollar amount that they voted with. Uh, we can see small business incubation still very much at the top, ag tech and agricultural production right behind it, uh, drone and autonomous logistics distribution warehousing uh, still getting a, a very respectable amount of votes, uh, but just not quite as intense as we saw with things uh, from IT and data going upwards, hospitality and agritourism, agricultural technology, agricultural production, and small business incubation. Uh, so let's go on to our next one here. 
Uh, I'm not going to read all of the, the comments to you guys, but uh, we wanted to just give you a sampling of some of the types of feedback that we got. Um, some of it was obviously very positive, but some of it was a little bit more negative. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that we, we showed all of this to you guys so that you can see that we are taking into account and factoring in all of the different viewpoints uh, that we have encountered throughout this process. Um, the one in the lower right in particular uh, was one that uh, was representative of something that we heard more than once. Um, but I think that all of these are, are indicative of the, the types of things that we have, have seen uh, throughout all of these public engagement efforts. Uh, let's go on to our next one. So the draft study sections, uh, these are the ones that we are wrapping up right now and getting ready to start compiling into the final document. In fact, I think we've already started compiling some of these. Um, and all of these are going to be the, the study sections that you'll be able to read in the draft of the document as soon as that's completed. Uh, the uh, staff team that we've been working with have, have already seen drafts of, of most of these. Uh, let's go into our next one. So what are our next steps? Uh, we will be continuing to develop the draft study uh, between now and the end of this month, early July, we'll be turning that over to the staff uh, and they will be uh, preparing for a public uh, comment and review period. Um, then in later July and into August, we will revise as necessary based on whatever it is that we uh, get in that final public comment period. And we'll be preparing a final study document uh, that we will be coming back and presenting both to this group and also to the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, next step. Uh, so questions, uh, if you guys have anything that, that comes up that you either don't want to discuss in this particular forum or anything that you just think of later on, uh, my email and my phone number are right there. Courtney's are also down below, but again, as I mentioned, Courtney is out on maternity leave. Uh, so she might not be able to get back to you as quickly if you send things to her. So if there is something you're sending to her, please do CC me on it for the next couple of weeks uh, until she is back in the office and, and back up to speed and ready to go. Uh, at this point, I will turn it over to the group. And if there are any questions right now that I can answer for you guys, uh, any, any specific things that anyone wants to to hear any more about. I just want to say a lot of great work and creativity, frankly, has gone into this project. I really appreciate the team's um, willingness to try new things. We were the, the first jurisdiction group that you've worked with where the monopoly was at play. We got great feedback from that, a lot of participation. Um, as, um, as we said, you know, we had our, our first event at Exploration Commons, which was really successful um, in the winter time. And then our April meeting, we didn't have as many people show up as we would have liked at Exploration Commons. It was a lot of competing um, interest that particular evening. So we went to where the people were because we had this great setup of boards and monopoly money to really engage in the process. So we took it to our budget and management public hearing, had great response there, um, and to the Tawny Town business breakfast, as well as the online presence. So we're really uh, thrilled with the responses that we have received and the really great frank discussion that um, the team has had with the various focus groups and individual participants. So I wanna thank Martin and his team um, and Jordan and, and Ben and all for all the great work that they've done on this project. Linda, that's so kind of you to say. Thank you very much. Uh, the the Monopoly boards is one that I'm I'm particularly proud of the team. That was all uh, Ben and Erica coming up with that and, and doing all of the design work for it. Uh, you know, it can be it can be challenging to get the the public to want to really engage with topics like uh, you know economic development and land use initiatives. It's uh, one of the things that. Uh, somewhat less controversial than a lot of the other types of things that people get to, to go to public meetings about. Uh, 
Uh, so we have to, to constantly be on our toes trying to come up with creative ways to keep people excited and engaged and, and get them to want to participate and keep coming back. Uh, so you guys have, have a really great community. Uh, my We have some, some property in adjacent Frederick County, uh, so I spend a lot of time up in the Carroll County area, uh, and, and I just love I just love it there. The people there are great. You've got some really great restaurants uh, and some some beautiful, beautiful vistas. Thank you for the kind words and thank you for your excellent report. Um, we look forward to seeing it go forward. So, of course. Uh, I will hang around in case there's any uh, public comment. I noticed that at the end of the agenda. Um, but if there are any questions for Ben or Jordan, uh, I'd love to try and get those in now, if there's a way. Gentlemen, All right. any questions? Well, I'll be hanging around to the end of the meeting in case there are uh, any, other, any other final thoughts. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, moving on, item 10, the annual report. Tiffany Fawcett. Yeah, so Tiffany will be presenting to you, as it says, the annual report. This is a report that we um, do for the Maryland Department of Planning. Um, it's part of the uh, state land use article that we produced this report on the building um, and development activities of the prior year. This really dovetails in nicely with the Board of Education Facilities Master Plan that you heard earlier this evening and the concurrency management report. Um, so with that, Tiffany has worked really hard over the past year as well as other staff in our municipalities. We not only do this for the county um, area, but also all of our municipalities, we get the information from them and we compile, compile it into one concise document to meet the requirements for everyone. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to um, Tiffany to share um, her presentation this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Are you not able to hear me? Yep, we can hear you, but it just oh, says okay. go to meeting on the screen. So if you can just pull up your presentation. Okay. So you may want to exit out of the go to meeting thing. Okay. Let me touch and share my screen and share. There we go. I'm seeing the plant. Wonderful. Hopefully everyone has already received a copy of the planning annual report. Um, looks like this. And um, oh, my controls are not working on my screen here. Oh, there we go. So I will be coming um, before you tonight for just the introduction. And on the 20th, I'll be back in front of the commission asking for a letter of certification for the, in for the information pertaining to the county in the annual report. Um, if you have any questions tonight, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, if I can, we'll answer them tonight. And if we can't, we'll just jot it down and I'll bring back um, answers on the 20th. So the purpose of the annual report is it is a state requirement um, in the land use article under the um, Maryland Annotated Code of Maryland. And it is, uh, it, it tells us, sorry, the purpose of the annual report is to tell the planning and development activity for the last calendar year. And all of these items that are under listed on this um, page are the things that we will be going through that are listed in the annual report. But the report includes information for Carroll County and all eight of the municipalities. The municipal development information and data, and data is provided by town staff, and this is a multi-agency effort. And those um, names that are involved is a full page of names listed at the beginning of the report right after the table of contents and before the introduction. Based on the land use article, development related activities are to be consistent with the local adopted plans and should implement the 12 state planning visions. Those are also found in the um, Carroll County comprehensive plan as well. 
So the annual report starts this year with a, a new um, addition, that is the at a glance, that just kind of goes over the, um, the areas that are covered within the report, uh, just so it's just at a glance, and if you needed more information, you can go to the table of contents, see where that's located in the plan, in the report, and then go find it in the report for more detailed information. But this was just information at a glance, and that's located on page two. Pages three through 13 are new plans and plan amendments, and that includes maps one through nine. For plan amendments, there were no new plans, but there were several amendments to the Carroll County Water and Sewer Master Plan that became effective in 2022 as part of the fall 2021 and spring 2022 amendment cycle. These amendments pertain to the Town of Manchester, the City of Westminster, Town of Union Bridge, Freedom Area, the Town of Hampstead. They each have zoomed in maps located, um, maps one through seven, and then there are county-wide maps that you can view on pages eight and nine. Pages 14 through 18 are the site plans and subdivisions approved in 2022, and they include tables one through four, as well as map 10. Tables one through four are summarized here with the approved site plans and subdivisions uh, for residential. There was a total of 30 new lots approved, 158 units, 202.71 acres. Out of that, there was the county had 27 new lots and the municipalities consisted of Tawnytown and Westminster with three new lots. There were also 215.18 acres of non-residential site plans and subdivisions approved. The counties consisted of 182.08 acres and municipalities that had, that contributed to that is was were Mount Airy, Sykesville, Tawnytown, Union Bridge, and Westminster with a total uh, combined of 33.1 acres of non-residential site plans and subdivisions approved. Map 10 shows those subdivisions and site plans approved on page 18. Here in just the presentation, but not in the plan, we're showing the residential development 10 year trend for the county only. This does not include municipalities. And that's showing that 27 approved plans last year, residential approved last year, lots. And this is the non-residential over the last 10 years. Again, not in the report itself, but it, just in the presentation for your uh, view here. And that does not include the municipalities again, but there was 182 acres approximately that were approved uh, for non-residential development. And that just shows what it looks like over the last 10 years. Pages 19 through 21 show the zoning map amendment, and that includes table five and six, as well as maps, map 11. Table five is the annexations, and it shows that there were five annexations total, one in Hampstead, one in Tawnytown, one in Union Bridge, and two in Westminster last year. Rezonings are shown in table six on page 20, and there were four rezonings last year. A single property in the Freedom Area had um, split zone rezoning here, and that's why it's so long there. And then there was also a rezoning um, in Carroll County for two properties, and then one in Hampstead. The zoning map amendments um, can be shown on, uh, they're shown in map 11 on page 21. That includes the annexations and rezonings on that map. Pages 22 through 30 are for changes that involve zoning text amendments, amendments to PFA boundaries, new schools, transportation, APFOs, and park facilities, and it includes table seven. 
In 2022, there were seven local ordinances that, affecting, that were affecting future development in chapters 158 and 155, and they are summarized here, but you'll see on page, on page 22 um, that they are more in depth. They involve revisions to the residential districts, agricultural, conservation, commercial, industrial, employment campus, and even definitions for all the districts. Several, um, and then processes for the zoning administrator. Under the chapter 155, it included definition changes and um, restricted development to agri agricultural remaining portions, and configured even streamlining in, in that section as well. There were seven municipalities that made revisions with 12 total local ordinances affecting future development. There was one in Hampstead, four in Mount Airy, New Windsor had one, Sykesville had one, Tawnytown with two, there were two in Union Bridge, and one in Westminster. Those can be seen more in depth on page 23 and a little bit on page 24. So changes uh, that involved amendments to the PFA boundaries, new schools, transportation, APFOs can be found on pages 25 through 27. For the PFA boundaries, there were no changes. For the um, Carroll County Public Schools, there was one constructed and opened. That was the 89,690 square foot Carroll County Career and Technology Center. Changes to roadway network were primarily system maintenance and local in nature, and those can be seen on uh, in tables uh, listed in Table Seven on page on page twenty six to twenty seven. And there were no developments that were modified due to APFO restrictions or adequate public facility ordinances. Park changes to park facilities can be found on pages 27 through 20, I'm mean, sorry, through 30. The county had no new park efforts made. However, um, efforts were focused on improving existing parks. Hampstead had two um, improvements made to War Memorial and Main Street and on Main Street and Chief Sites Park on Lower Beckleysville Road. New Windsor had a new park added as Fountain Park. Tawny Town had conditional approval for a park that they will be doing at Bollinger Park. And they also had some improvements made to the Roberts Mill Park. Westminster had improvements mostly with um, adding uh, pickleball court lines to King Park, Westminster City Park, and Westminster Family Fitness Center, as well as some renovations to the, um, the municipal school, uh, municipal pool. If we move forward to page 38 through 39, go over building permits issued, and that includes table 16 and map 13. In 2022, the building permits issued was a total of 418 issued. Of those, residential inside the PFA was 248. Residential outside the public, sorry, the priority funding areas was 114. Non-residential building permits issued inside the priority funding areas was 40. And non-residential building permits issued outside the priority funding areas was 16. For the growth areas below, the numbers are very similar to the, to the priority funding areas. Those 418 permits are mapped on page, on map 13 on page 39. Next pages 40 through 42 show the new use and occupancy certificates issued. That includes tables 17 and 18, as well as map 14. There were a total 578 use and occupancy or UNO certificates issued in 2022. Map 17 shows the type of UNO issued 
and the district or municipality that they were issued in. Table 18 is a summary of those with a total of 402 residential use and occupancy certificates issued inside the priority funding area, 121 residential outside the priority funding area. 38 non-residential use and occupancy certificates were issued inside the PFA and 17 non-residential were issued outside the PFA. Again, the growth area numbers are very close to the priority funding area numbers. And then there's just an added glance that we've added for the presentation here, what those numbers kind of look like inside and outside the areas. With the 578 uh, U and O certificates issued, you can see that in map 14, uh, and that is on page 42. However, it does it is uh, a little deceiving that it does not look like that many uh, 578, I believe it was, yes, uh, dots. But if you zoom in, you can see that um, several of the dots will be almost right over each other, where those uh, units. Maybe they could be apartments or they could be townhouses and each one would get its own uh, its own use and occupancy certificate. So residential use and occupancy certificates countywide, this is the trend over the last 10 years, including 528 in 2022, sorry, 523 in 2022. And this uptick of the last few years, we know that there was a lot of um, building going on in Tawnytown. And so I'm pretty sure that contributed to um, those numbers looking that high over the last few years. Non-residential UNO certificates countywide over the last 10 years. Um, this looks pretty high right here and compared to the last 10 years that it's at 55 last year. Um, we're, we're not sure, we're gonna wait and if uh, see what happens. Maybe it's an anomaly. Last year there were only 10, which was pretty low. So maybe some came in at the beginning of the year that would have uh, been at the end of 2021. Um, with the supply constraints and such, we're not sure. Pages 44 through 48 show the development capacity analysis, and that includes tables 20 through 24, maps 15 and 16. And we also refer to the development capacity analysis as the buildable land inventory or the BLI. So tables 20 through 22 on pages 44 through 46 show the existing and potential developable residential lots. So for existing units, these are ones that are already developed, there's a total of 66,229 units. 55% of that is existing dwelling units inside the priority funding areas and 45% are outside. <coughs> Very similar numbers to the growth areas as well. For potential lots, lots that have not been developed yet, there's a total, there's an estimated total of 18,932. 39% of those potential lots are inside the PFA and 61% are outside the PFA. The MGA uh, numbers are slightly different there um, with 44% of the dwelling units inside and 56% outside. And I'm sorry, that should say um, lots, not dwelling units there. I apologize. And you can see that mapped, the potential residential development is mapped on in map 15 on page 46. Tables 23 through 24 on pages 47 and 48 show the existing and potential developable non-residential acreage. For existing acreage that is developed, there is 4,897 acres. 82% of that existing acreage is inside the priority funding areas and 18% is outside. For the potential developable acreage, there's a total of estimated total of 3,536 acres with 80%, 87% of that potential acreage inside the PFA and 13% being outside the PFA. And again, there is a map showing the potential of non-residential development. That's map 16 on page 48. 
Next is the agricultural land preservation, um, pages 49 through 50. And that includes tables 25 and 26, as well as map 17. The 2022 agricultural land preservation activity was 892 acres, which included 14 farms or preserved agricultural land. Since 1979, a total of 77,487 acres or 77.5% of land preserved has of land has been preserved for agricultural use. And the 77.5% is of the 100,000 acre goal that Carroll County has. There was 7,067,112 dollars committed to agricultural preservation based off fiscal year 2022 and 59% of that were county funds. Map 17 shows the land preservation easements for 2022 on page 50. And here's what that looks like over the last five years with 892 acres being preserved in 2022. This is just, this is not in the report. This is just in the presentation. This shows the development and easements over the last five years from 2018 to 2022 with the ag pres, so the preserved agricultural land um, in the darker blue in the uh, five years. And then the, the other two are stacked. It is approved residential development and approved non-residential development. So development is shown next to the ag preservation there. So the next steps this year, all eight municipalities have already certified their information. It is included in the report before sending it to the county. They've all also seen the copy of the draft. There were a few minor changes that have now been um, in, implemented, included in the one that you are now seeing. Um, next, the county plan will come back to the County Planning Commission on the 20th, asking for a letter of certification for the information pertaining to the county that is in the report. And then after that, we will send a final report to MDP or the Maryland Department of Planning, and, and we will send another one to the Board of County Commissioners before we distribute it to all the municipalities and make it available to the public online. Are there any questions? I believe that is quite extensive. Thank you for that. Anybody have any questions here? No, no question. Don't. Good report. Oh. A lot of, a lot of, no question, but good report. A lot of good information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bearing with me through my jitters at the beginning. <laughs> Appreciate that. You did fine. Nice job, Tiffany. Thank you. So. Okay, next we will, and we will see you back next um, meeting too. So 11 is general comment. Do we have anybody on here? Control, is there any public, uh, we don't recall anyone signing up prior to the meeting. So I don't believe there's any ge general public here this evening. Um, I'm not seeing any in the screen, but Right. No, there's none that I know about either. Okay. Steven, did you have something you wanted to say? No, 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 no. No, not at all. Okay. So everything was uh, everything was good. Okay. All right. Um then we were to number twelve, adjournment. Our next meeting is June twentieth, Tuesday at nine AM in the Reagan room. 003 and we won't have Linda but we will have Mr. Hine. So looking You're forward in good hands. Yes. Looking forward to seeing everybody then. Thanks you thank you Linda for everything yeah. and uh, good luck uh, you know your uh, you. new venture is their gain and our loss. We'll, uh, oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Certainly miss it was you. great working with you all. I'm going to miss you all too. Take care. Yes, Thanks so much. Thanks.
Thank you. Okay. Good night, gentlemen. Yes, and late. We need a motion for adjournment. Yeah. Oh, yes. We forgot that part. I, I make a motion that we adjourn. Yeah. A second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Then thank you. And I thought I was going to get through scot free, but. <laughs> <laughs> Great job, Janice. <laughs> Good night.